seated. We are continuing today our series on the book of Romans, which is also a journey through Max Lucado's book called In the Grip of Grace, which is a study of the book of Romans. We're going to be taking a break soon because the holidays are quickly approaching. And so with that, we'll break away from Romans here in a couple of weeks, but we got a couple of messages left and we may pick it up sometime at a future date. We'll see how that goes. But for today, we're going to look at Romans chapter 3 here in just a moment. But let me summarize a little bit these first few chapters of Romans. It's very simple, although it goes much deeper than what I'm about to share. But uh, you could basically say that up to this point, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, the basic message of Paul is that everyone on God's green earth has blown it. I mean, that pretty much summarizes the first few chapters of the book of Romans. Remember I said he was going to give us the bad news before he gave us the good news, and that's the bad news. The hut-building brother that we talked about last month, well, he blew it because he was more pleasure-minded than he was God-minded. The fault-finding brother, remember the judgmental brother, he was more high-minded than he was God-minded. And then you had the rock-stacking brother who represented the legalist. Well, he was more works-oriented than he was grace-oriented. And so the first one, the, the pleasure-seeking brother, well, he tried to disregard God in his life and just not give him any attention or any favor. The second one, the judgmental brother, well, he tried to distract God by looking at the sins of other people rather than his own. And then the works-oriented brother, he tried to reimburse God, thinking if I can be good enough, I can work my way back to heaven and not have to worry about this grace thing, you know. But what they all had in common is that they all missed God. They were all without Him. They were all filled with sin, and they missed His grace. And as a result, they were all lost. Well, here in Romans 3, and beginning at verse 21... There is a shift that takes place in the book of Romans. We go from what a mess to what a God. We go from what a mess we're in to what a God we have. And so we should all be glad that the book of Romans is not in chapter 3 and verse 20. Because at that point... We're all under God's condemnation and we're all without hope. But things take a shift here in Romans 3 and verse 21. These are the verses that we have been waiting for Paul to write. You see, through the first 80 verses of the book of Romans, it's as though we've been in a dark room with the Apostle Paul as he has described the fatality of our sin. Every candle is burned down to the wick. Every lamp is empty of oil. We've stumbled in the darkness just looking for just a glimpse of light, but we haven't found any. And now as we approach the latter part of chapter 3, it's like Paul has gone over to the window, and he's put his hands on the latches, and he's about to throw open the shutters and let the light in and say that God has made a way, that God has made a way. So let's look at Romans 3 now, verses 21 through 26. And here comes Paul with some good news. After talking about how messed up we are and how we've all sinned, he says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. 
In Max Lucado's book that we've been following, In the Grip of Grace, he gives an example of something that happened to him with his car insurance company that we're going to use as a basis of illustrating grace today. He talks about how time when he received a letter from his car insurance company indicating that they were going to drop his coverage. He emphasized, I didn't drop them, they dropped me. Not because my premiums weren't paid, because they'd all been submitted, everything was paid up. And they weren't dropping me because the paperwork wasn't done. Every paper had been signed and mailed in dutifully. No, he said they were dropping me because we had made too many mistakes. And so he gets the letter, and he says it began politely enough, but then it said, we have secured motor vehicle records that indicate a speeding violation by Mr. Lucado in December and another in January, and an accident by Mrs. Lucado in December. Further review indicates another speeding ticket by Mr. Lucado in April and by Mrs. Lucado in December of the following year. Max Lucado says, Okay, I'll be the first to admit that my wife and I can be a little heavy-footed and careless. But isn't that the whole reason we purchase car insurance to begin with? Don't my blemishes prove that I'm a worthy client? <laughs> doesn't the whole insurance industry, isn't that why it was invented in the first place for people like me? And don't my blemishes, and my speeding violations put food on some adjuster's table? I thought about these things, and when I first received the letter from the insurance company, before I opened it, I thought that maybe, just maybe, they were writing to congratulate me on being such a good customer. <laughs> or maybe they're going to hold a banquet in my honor and present me with some type of an award. But then I read the next paragraph. Our records also indicate a claim that we paid for an accident that Mr. Lucado had on November 18th when he hit a car in a parking lot. Max Lucado says, the use of the word another, in fact it was used twice, alarmed me. Somebody's counting. <laughs> Maybe I should have my insurance adjuster read 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, where it says that love keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> but I didn't have much hope in that. The letter went on and said, We also paid a claim when your wife, well, Mrs. Lucado, uh, rear-ended a car at a traffic light. But she was getting the baby her bottle, Lucado argued. She was sitting at a traffic light and Sarah dropped her bottle onto the floorboard and she started crying. My wife reached down to pick it up and when she did, she lifted her foot a little bit on the brake pedal and the car reached forward and hit the car in front of her. It was an honest mistake. It could have happened to anybody. And as far as my hitting that car in the parking lot, when it happened, I went into the office building and I searched and searched until I found the rightful owner of the car. I explained what happened. I gave him my insurance information. I did everything right. Maybe I should get my insurance agent to read 1 John 1, 9 that says that if we had confessed our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I mean, shouldn't I get rewarded at least a little bit for being honest? Apparently not. Because the letter then concludes by saying, we regret to inform you that we are no longer going to be able to provide coverage for you and your family, and your automobile insurance will be canceled as of 1201 on January the 4th. We regret that this letter could not be more favorable. So Max Lucado says, I was reflecting on this and I thought to myself, so let me get this straight. I purchase car insurance just in case I make a mistake. And then when I make a mistake, they terminate me. 
am I missing something here? Was there something in the fine print that I didn't read? Were there some footnotes in the contract that just escaped my attention? Because it seems to me that they're saying that we will cover you and you will be considered insurable up until that time that we consider you to be uninsurable. At which point, we will eliminate your coverage. Isn't that like a doctor who says, we'll treat healthy patients only? Or a dentist who has a sign in his window that says, no cavities, please. <laughs> or a firefighter who says, we'll be there for you until your house goes up in flames. Or a bodyguard who says, I'll be right there beside you until somebody starts chasing you. Or a lifeguard who says, I'm going to keep an eye on you. You can count on it until you start to go under. Now, don't misunderstand, okay? Max Lucado is not being critical of the insurance industry. He's saying all this kind of tongue-in-cheek. You get that, right? I mean, he knows that insurance companies have to make money to stay in business, and they can't afford to keep people on that they consider to be high risk. But he's saying all this to make a point. And the point is this. What if heaven had this type of a policy? What if God treated us this way? What if you, for example, received a letter from the Pearly Gates Underwriting Division that said something like this? Dear Mr. or Mrs. Smith, we are writing in regards to your request for forgiveness this morning. Our records indicate that you have already reached your quota of grace and forgiveness. Our records show that since employing our services, you have sinned seven times in the areas of greed, you have sinned four times in the area of dishonesty, and two times in the area of pride. Not only that, but your prayer life is substandard in comparison to others of like age and circumstance. Further review indicates that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20 percentile and you have an excessive tendency to gossip. Because of these things, you are considered a high-risk candidate for heaven. And we're going to have to terminate our coverage. Grace does have its limits, you understand. Jesus sends his regrets and his kindest regards. Many people fear that they have already received such a letter. Some people worry that um, it's on the way. Because many times people think if, if an insurance company won't forgive me when I make honest mistakes, well, how is heaven going to treat me when I deliberately have disobeyed? But I want to tell you some things about grace that is illustrated in Romans chapter 3 that help us to understand that God is not like an insurance company. The first thing is the direction of grace. I want us to look at the direction of grace. By that I mean that grace comes from above, that it comes from heaven. One translation of Romans 3.21 says that God has made a way. You see, man has no way. We have no way of climbing the ladder up to God, but God has made a way for us. You see, the entire first three chapters of the book of Romans tells the story of mankind trying to reach God, of us trying to come up with our own methods to get to him. And they always fall short. Because grace comes from above. The only way we can get to heaven is God coming to us. And so in your understanding of grace and in your understanding of God reconciling us to himself, always remember that grace is God-driven, God-given, 
And God originated. It comes from Him. John MacArthur said that as far as salvation is concerned, there are only two religions that the world has ever known or ever will know. The first one is the religion of divine accomplishment, which is biblical Christianity. And the other is the religion of human achievement, which is every other religion in the world. You see, Christianity teaches that God came down to us, that God reconciled us to himself. Every other religion in the world is about mankind trying to make himself good enough to be accepted by God. Making himself better, making himself more righteous, making himself more acceptable, and it always falls short. Grace is God-given. And so understand, first of all, that grace came, comes from above. It's not us working our way to God, but God loving us and coming down to us. Second thing about grace isn't just the direction of grace, but I want you to think about for a moment the dilemma of grace. Let's go back to the insurance example for a moment. Would anybody blame Max Lucado's car insurance for terminating the coverage? Probably not. They have every right to do so, right? They're completely within the law. They can cover whom they wish. And if they choose to terminate someone's coverage, they can certainly do that. No one would fault them for that. Well, understand that, that God was, could have been well within his rights just to cut us off, too. You're going back to Genesis. He told Adam and Eve that if they ate of the fruit, they would surely die. And Jesus could have stayed in heaven and never come to earth and never brought grace and salvation, and no one really could fault God for that because he would have been within his rights. But here's the dilemma. God loves us. And he wants to make us right with him, so what's he going to do? With the insurance company, let's suppose that the CEO of the insurance company, for some reason, wanted to retain Max Lucado and his wife. And he thought... Well, I want to make it right, but he can't just overlook all their transgressions, all their accidents, and all their violations. Why not? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, if he did so, it would jeopardize the integrity of the company. I mean, they would lose all credibility. They would not be going according to their policies if they were to do that. But the second reason, and probably just as important, is that it would encourage reckless driving. If they just said to Max Lucado, we're gonna keep you on, we're just gonna pretend that none of this stuff ever happened. We're gonna pretend that you have no tickets and no accidents, you just go on and we'll keep you covered and don't worry about a thing. And Max Lucado and his wife would probably just get behind the wheel and think, man, we got a free ride and we're never gonna get in trouble, never be punished, never have to answer for this. And it wouldn't just encourage reckless driving for them, but for the rest of the population, too, if that's how insurance companies are going to be, anybody can just drive any way they want. Well, God has an issue here, too, where he wants to make us right, but he can't just turn a blind eye to the sins of his people. Because if God said, well, I know mankind has sinned and they've all gone their own way and I know they've all been rebellious and and they've disregarded me, well, that's okay, I'll let them come to heaven anyway, and never send Jesus or anything. The problem with that is, in a very similar way, he would jeopardize his integrity. God is a holy God, a righteous God, and his integrity would be jeopardized if he accepted sin into his presence and into heaven. But then also, it would encourage reckless living. It would be like, well, God doesn't care how we live, and so we would never honor him, we would never glorify him, we would never live the way that he wants us to live, and it would just encourage anybody and everybody to live any way they want, and say, well, there are going to be no consequences at all, and we'll all go to heaven when we die, and what's the big deal? And so this is the dilemma of grace. What's God to do if he loves us? And he wants to make us right with him. He wants us to be reconciled and he wants to take us to heaven. Then he's got a dilemma. 
So the last thing I want us to talk about is the decision of grace. All right, he's got this dilemma, so what decision is he going to make? Well, one more time, let's go to the insurance company. Let's suppose that the CEO of the insurance company decides that he, he's thought of a way that he could reinstate the Lucado family, and he calls them into his office. And he says to them, you know, I, I look at your record and, and you understand we, we, we can't just ignore it. We, you can't just pretend that it never happened. However, we've done some research and there is one particular person who has a spotless record who's willing to trade records with you. This person has never been in an accident, never had a violation, not even a parking ticket. They got an unblemished driving record. And this person is willing to trade records with you to where all of your transgressions, all of your speeding violations, all of the claims would be placed upon his record and he would suffer the consequences. And his pure, unblemished record would be placed under your name. And if this were to really happen, you could almost see Max Lucado's jaw dropping and say, who in the world would be willing to do this? And the CEO says, I would. On a much, 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 much grander scale, that's what God did for us. Only it's multiplied exponentially because of the suffering and the weight of sin that Jesus took upon him. The only way that God's justice could be satisfied, the only way that God could maintain his integrity and his credibility for who he was, maintain his righteousness and for his law and his justice to be satisfied would be for somebody who was pure and holy to take the punishment of the sins that we bore and to put it upon Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus did. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that the Lord laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity or the evil, the sin of us all. And there's a verse that I've asked Pastor John to put up on the screen for me. 2 Corinthians 5.21. You might want to jot this verse down if you don't know it, if you're not familiar with it. Because this is the exchange that took place at Calvary. It says that he, that's God, has made him, that's a reference to Jesus, to be sin for us. This is the principle of substitution we often talk about in the church. Jesus took our place. You and I should have died on the cross, you understand. We should have been punished. We should have bore the guilt. But God made Jesus to be sin for us. Now, don't let that confuse you. It doesn't mean it made Jesus a sinner. There's a difference. Because look at the next phrase. Who knew no sin? All right? God made Jesus to be sin for us even though he himself knew no sin. What that means is that God put Jesus in the place of sin, the place that sin rightly deserved was the cross. And God put Jesus there. And then it says, so that we, you and I, might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see the transaction? Here is Jesus, pure, holy, unstained, unblemished, never once outside the will of God, perfect in every way. And then we have sin-stained mankind, people like you and me, who've disobeyed God, gone our own way, totally undeserving of his grace and his mercy. And he's switched places with us. And he took all of our punishment upon him. That's what all the rejection was about. That's what the unjust trial was about. That's what the crown of thorns were about and all the mocking that he endured and the lashes upon his back and the nails through his hands and feet. That's what the spear was for. That's what everything that he endured on that cross and leading up to it was about. It was about our punishment. And he took it upon himself. <coughs> That's what Paul meant in Romans 3, verse 21, when he says, God has made a way. He spent 80 verses just showing what a terribly, 
terribly wicked hole we have dug for ourselves. And that we can never make our way back to God. And then he says in Romans 3.20, but God, but God has made a way and this is it. Aren't you thankful that God has made it possible? And so since we're talking about insurance, I'll go ahead and throw this in. You're in good hands <laughs> with Jesus. All right? And if you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, will you do that today? His grace is waiting for you. He's not asking you to make yourself better first. He's not, making you to, he's not telling you to clean yourself up first. He's saying, you come to me just the way you are, with your sin and everything. Bring it to me. Don't think he hasn't seen it before. He's seen it from all of us. He's saying, bring it to me, and I'll wash you white as snow. Let's stand together as we pray. Our dear Lord in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you have made a way.